This is bonus video number 2, on the use of NPC dialogue in Skyrim. For the main video on NPC irony, I spent most of my time on linear Japanese RPGs, because they're my specialty. For this video, I wanted to step out of my comfort zone a little bit, and look at an open world, non-linear RPG. We're going to start with a look at my methods, as I think they help to explain my goal in this video, and the most important differences between a game like Skyrim and the Squaresoft classics. Normally, when I look at statistical trends in NPC speech in a game, I talk to every NPC and get every piece of dialogue they have. For a SNES or PS1 era RPG, that's a practical possibility. In Skyrim, it's significantly more difficult. The first reason for that difficulty is that there are vastly more NPCs in Skyrim than in any of the Golden Age Squaresoft games. Some of those NPCs can also be difficult to find. A few move through a large geographical area. Some of those only appear in certain places at certain times. And there is also a large number of NPCs that only appear, or only talk to you, after certain quests or quest chains have been completed. To add to that, the dialogue of any given NPC might vary greatly across the course of the game, as the player completes quests and gains attributes like a higher speech skill or various faction alliances. This makes it so that retrieving all the NPC dialogue for the whole game is not the most practical task. But I feel that we can still learn most of the important things we need to know about Skyrim's NPCs by studying them in a single representative state. Thus, this video is based on the initial state of the world of Skyrim. To collect NPC dialogue, I began a fresh game as a level 1 character with average stats and average skills. I deliberately avoided specializing in speech and picked the Imperial Race option to minimize the number of adverse reactions I would get from NPCs. The Imperial faction is mostly neutral with other races, but some Stormcloak NPCs started with a lower disposition towards my character than normal. For the most part, the type of dialogue I received was not much affected by my character build. I collected the dialogue data only from the major cities of Skyrim, Whiterun, Falkreath, Solitude, Windhelm, Dawnstar, Morthal, Riften, Winterhold, and Markarth. This, I felt, gave me a large enough sample size to extrapolate the important trends to NPCs all over Skyrim. Although there are some moderately sized towns with significant NPC populations, there are fewer towns than there are cities, and the cities have far more people in them. Maybe not Winterhold, but that depends on how you count the NPCs in the Mage's College. Within cities, I itemized dialogue according to new topics. When approaching an NPC in a SNES-era Squaresoft game, the player usually has no control over what the topic of conversation will be. In a few cases, that's true of Skyrim as well. But most of the time, the player has several topics to pick from when talking to a Skyrim NPC. I counted each of these as a separate bit of NPC dialogue, except when multiple options have the same endpoint. Not every speech option is a separate topic. Sometimes the player reaches a branching point within a topic, but every answer to the given branches is on the same topic and elicits the same NPC reaction. But many NPCs have multiple dialogue options that fall into different categories. For example, many city dwellers have some kind of local direction dialogue which helps new arrivals to the city find its important amenities. Hmm, plenty. I'd say we're prosperous enough. Most folk don't go hungry, if they're willing to work hard. The city's ruled by the Jarl up in Dragon's Reach. That's the fortress there, up on the tall hill. But you're probably more interested in your Vasker, Mead Hall of the Companions. I call these repeated phrases zone dialogue, as it is particular to a geographic zone rather than to the voice of the NPC that speaks it. Indeed, zone dialogue is so common that if I were to record each instance as a direction dialogue, a graph of them would be overwhelmingly skewed towards the direction category. And to some degree, that would be an accurate representation of the game. But the fact that zone dialogue is exactly the same from person to person means that these direction dialogues aren't really separate events. Rather, we can think of them as a kind of blanket direction spread out over a zone like a city, or even in some cases, the whole of Skyrim. Therefore, most of the data you will see in graphs is, from the city-dwelling NPCs of Skyrim, unique to one or two characters, only counted once per topic or purpose, rather than once per dialogue branch. But at the same time, I'm not only interested in quantitative data. As we'll see, Skyrim trends overwhelmingly towards elaboration about place and directions to complete a quest. That could seem a little boring. It gets interesting when we look at how those things happen and why. 
Open-world RPGs present two major problems to players entering them, problems which the designer must anticipate. The problems are right there in the name of the genre. The first is the open-world problem, and the second is the RPG problem. In a genre where a player can go virtually anywhere at any time, brand new players are met with too many choices. This can cause what game designers call choice paralysis or analysis paralysis. Not everyone experiences this. Some genre veterans are extremely self-directed. But for the majority of players, a little bit of optional structure helps them to enjoy the freedom of the open world. The second primary problem is the RPG problem. As I have said many times in my research, the design feature that separated the RPG from its wargame ancestors is the level up. In any game with a progressive level up system, the player needs to be able to go to new places and do new things that were impossible for lower level characters. But in an open world context, this can create organizational problems as players can wander into content which is inappropriate for their current level. That kind of danger is essential for both the open world and RPG aspects of the game, but new players can be frustrated if they don't know how or where to find content that is appropriate for their character's level. This is where Skyrim's NPCs come in. The primary function of NPCs in an open world game is to provide an organizational framework to tell the player where things like quests, quest givers, shops, dungeons, loot, and even alchemy ingredients are located. Most open world RPGs use their NPCs this way, but some do it more artfully than others. Skyrim uses two main strategies for transmitting information through the NPCs that inhabit its cities and some of its villages. The first is event-based clustering, and the second is diffuse funneling. Event-based clustering is the easier one to visualize because it basically means that a bunch of NPCs come together for a story event. The best example is Rogbeer's execution in Solitude. Half the city is present at the front gate when the player character enters. After the event, which only takes about a minute or so, those NPCs all depart on foot at a relatively slow speed, giving the player a chance to follow and or talk to them. But the event itself is also an important bit of NPC dialogue. In this event, we learn that Imperial power is still ascendant in solitude. We also learn that the Imperials were totally surprised by the assassination of the High King and other important political details. Similar, though smaller events happen in other cities, almost always right as the player is entering the town for the first time. In Morthal, a group of citizens addresses their ruler over some unresolved grievances. In Markarth, a bunch of guards and city folk gather in the marketplace after the assassination of an important citizen. The purpose of these events is to introduce the player to some of the important people in the city all at once, making several future quest lines more accessible. Then, later on, if the player goes in search of those NPCs, after they've returned to their shops, the player will probably encounter several other NPCs who have their own quest chains. In the end, event-based clustering forms a network of connections which the player can follow to help structure their playthrough of the game. While Solitude, Markarth, and Morthal have the bigger cluster events, most cities have some version of this kind of event. On the streets of Whiterun, there are a couple of loud NPC discussions which reveal the conflicts between the Grey Mains and the Battleborns and the economic situation in the city. The Jarl of Solitude gives an audience which also acts as a smaller clustering event. The Jarl of Dawnstar does the same thing, although in a more hostile way. Similarly, a couple of thugs on the streets of Windhelm accost the Dark Elf resident of the city to illustrate the racial tensions inflamed by Stormcloak political rhetoric. Because it's not our fight. Hey, maybe the reason these Grayskins don't help in the war is because they're Imperial spies. Imperial spies? You can't be serious. Each of these events only brings together a few NPCs, but the effect is still similar. In every city, there is also what I call informal clustering events that happen at certain gathering places, mostly the city inn. At night, NPCs gather at the city inn, ostensibly for socialization or entertainment before they go to sleep. But of course, we as players see through that irony and understand that the people at the inn are there for us. Most experienced RPG players know that innkeepers offer a lot of minor quests. But because numerous NPCs gather at the inn, they also bring with them any quests that they might have offered out in their various places of employment. The inn doesn't usually offer the same bonanza of quests that a clustering event does, the number of NPCs is smaller, and the cast of NPCs can vary based on the day, time of day, or many other player-triggered changes in the world. 
But the nice thing about the informal clustering event of the inn is that it recurs, and players will pick up on that fact. The mirror of the event clustering strategy is the diffuse funnel strategy. In this strategy, a group of NPCs is spread out all across the world, and they funnel the player toward a single point. The best examples of this are the many NPCs who direct the player towards the Bard's College or the College of Winterhold. Bards in the cities of Skyrim recommend going to Solitude to join the college. I'm a Bard, trained at the Bard's College in Solitude. Wanderers like you should think about applying. Essentially, these references form a giant funnel moving the player towards Solitude. Should the player then join the Bard's College, they'll be connected to all the NPCs of that faction and given a quest chain which sends them back out into the world. A similar thing happens with references to the College of Winterhold. Because there are no mage guilds in the cities, as there were in Oblivion, it's a little more difficult to find information about where to learn new magic. Court wizards, from whom the player buys most of his or her magic at the beginning of the game, do make reference to the college. But the chances of meeting a court wizard other than Farangar in Whiterun during the main quest are much lower than those of meeting an innkeeper. Relatively few quests direct you to talk to a wizard. It's far more likely that the innkeeper will mention the college instead. This particular set of directions doesn't make a ton of sense from a storytelling perspective, but its practical functions are unaffected. Various other funnels exist in the world too, pushing the player towards joining one side of the civil war or the other, or the companions faction. The Companions? In Jorvaskr? These are a little more sparse than the Bard's College or Mage's College, but still present in a few different places. Even the Dark Brotherhood has a kind of funnel, although it is steeped in idiosyncratic irony. Innkeepers and other NPCs will remark that a child in Windhelm is trying to summon the Dark Brotherhood. Nobody seems to believe that the child could actually succeed, but the whole conversation is just a bit of irony for the player's benefit although the NPCs aren't sure if the Dark Brotherhood is real, or concerned with the wishes of an orphan, the player will nevertheless understand that this is an important illusion about how to join that faction. That Aventus Aretino is doing the Black Sacrament? Trying to summon the Dark Brotherhood? Oh, Grimbar. Always with a nonsense. No, no. Because the designers of Skyrim accomplished so much through their NPCs, there's a lot more to say about them beyond the big structural ideas and statistical analyses. Much of their artfulness comes down to how the NPCs accomplish their various ironic and narrative goals. To start, I just want to consider the topic of plausibility. Earlier, I mentioned that the primary funnel to the College of Winterhold is through court wizards and innkeepers. The notion that court wizards would direct amateur mages towards their alma mater makes total sense. The fact that innkeepers also send the player in that direction with equal consistency is a little stranger. There are obvious structural reasons why innkeepers should say these things. Players expect to gather practical information from inns. Winterhold's remote location presents a practical problem. Thus, we have a slightly artless solution that functions well enough. I point this out only because it's a relatively rare example of Skyrim using NPCs in a clumsy way. The rest of the time, the designers create more plausible encounters. One of my favorites is this passing encounter in Solitude. Hmm. If you ever want to replace those old rags, stop by Radiant Raiment. Until next time. Hmm. Tari, the proprietor of the clothing shop, mocks the player character's choice of garment, but backpedals if the player stops to talk with her. This quest is a great example of several clever techniques that the designers are using all at the same time. First, Tari catches the player's attention with an unsolicited quip. Then she backpedals on her insult and offers the player a quest. That quest puts the player character in front of the Jarl, who is in the middle of an audience. This is an example of a small quest which pushes the player towards a clustering event. All of the interactions that put the player on this path are totally plausible. That's an example of good fiction. But this interaction is also elegant from a mechanical perspective. A quest that puts the player in front of the Jarl requires no combat, no speech checks, and no required items, except the clothes that the quest giver hands you at the start. Because of all this, the player can easily discover a whole network of NPCs and quests in a totally natural way. Skyrim is full of these little go talk to X or talky quests, as I call them, that put the player at the doorstep of a quest chain or a network of important NPCs. Several of the major cities have them. There are three such quests in Riften, 
Whiterun and Solitude, two such quests in Falkreath, and one each in Windhelm, Dawnstar, and Winterhold. There's a whopping four talky quests in Markarth. That last point is the one that showed me how and why these talky quests were placed. Markarth is the largest and most complex city, which is why there are so many exploration-based quests there. In order to help the player understand how to navigate the city, the player is sent to do various simple errands. The errands are, in a sense, inappropriate for the legendary Dragonborn, but they're an excellent way to show the player around the city while providing some simple quest rewards along the way. Skyrim does amazingly well at accomplishing multiple practical design goals with its NPCs, but much of what NPCs do is solely for the sake of storytelling or world building. The central design pillar of Skyrim is the creation of a persuasive world, but the kind of artistry employed in NPC dialogue differs from character to character. In addition to all of the funnels, clusters, and networks in Skyrim, there are also many NPCs whose only job it is to stand by and make the world seem real. I'm no one special, just a miner who swings a pickaxe for his drinking money. I call these Dunsel NPCs, meaning something whose only purpose is decorative. In my analysis of the JRPG classics, I never made this distinction because the elaboration category already serves so well. But in Skyrim, there's an important difference in the level of interactivity these NPCs offer. All quest participants and vendors in Skyrim have a small interactive menu, which pops up when the player speaks with them. The Dunsel NPCs lack this, although they do have plenty of dialogue. I'm on my way to Solitude to join the Legion. A united empire is better for everyone. And that dialogue does fall into the normal elaboration categories, accomplishing various storytelling goals throughout the world of Skyrim. If anything, these NPCs are a move towards a more Japanese style of dialogue. In previous Elder Scrolls games, almost every NPC had a menu that opened into several dialogue options. The need to give these characters speech menu options inadvertently led to a lot more zone dialogue. You can see this in earlier Elder Scrolls games, as well as numerous other PC RPGs in the D&D tradition. In Skyrim, perhaps because the developers had more time, money, and memory space, the world is full of people who are just there to make the world seem persuasive. They talk back, but the player has no way to steer the conversation with them. Lastly, I want to highlight a few spots of artistry that aren't necessarily idiosyncratic to Skyrim, but which are nevertheless great examples of NPCs doing what other art forms probably could not accomplish. The cluster event in Yorvaskar is a good, albeit brief, example of idiosyncratic storytelling. The event itself is a fight that breaks out as soon as the player enters the building. In a film, we would see only the combatants, mostly head-on in shot-reverse shot. At least one of the characters would be a main character, and so the story and camera would have to focus on the fight. But in a video game, the player is allowed to hover around the perimeter of the fight and hear the commentary of all the companions instead. Because nobody involved in the fight is that much more important than anyone else, this freedom suits the storytelling of the video game medium. Another idiosyncratic NPC interaction that the player can experience is a game of tag. In several cities, but most obviously in solitude, the player can enter a game of tag with the local children and simply play chase with them. There are plenty of chase scenes in modern film, television, and even other video games. But this interaction is different. There's no dramatic tension, nor any reward at stake. So why even put this in the game? If the goal of the designers was to offer the player chances to level up in every interaction, this game of tag would be superfluous. But if making Skyrim seem like a persuasive setting was more important than embedding a practical reward in every interaction, then these games of tag make more sense. This is a chance for the player to play the role of a benevolent hero, even if nothing's at stake. For players who only want to see their stats go up, this might be a disappointment. But for players who are really into the role-playing aspect of the game, these little bits of color make the world feel more alive. That's an important pillar of the RPG, and it always has been. Finally, in Morthal, there is a very well-done quest that begins with a deeply unnerving and highly idiosyncratic NPC interaction. In that city, many NPCs remark the recent burning of Frogger's house. The burning of the house is remarkable in and of itself. But what really unnerves the townsfolk is that Frogger, who lost his wife and child in the blaze, moves in with his new girlfriend, Alva, the very next day. Because Frogger still lives in the city, players naturally want to talk to him about the incident to 
to see if there's some piece of background information they're not getting from everybody else. But Haraka's responses are eerie. He goes about his day with a blank affect, acting as though nothing at all is wrong. The flat affect of his responses deepens the weirdness of the situation. I won't spoil the quest and its results, but I do want to note that we as players can only experience this sense of weirdness because Kroger is an NPC in an open world game. His responses are unnerving, that's true, but more than all of that, the fact that we can just watch him go about his life as though nothing has happened to him really brings the weirdness together. Kroger is not hiding some unspeakable grief, he's hiding something very different, but that's not something a book or film could convey in quite the same way. Skyrim has endured a lot of criticism over the years. Some of it has been warranted. The game isn't perfect. Many quest lines are truncated, there are lots of bugs, and the main quest line is a little uninspired. But I think the game also has lots of strengths that have been overlooked. Few people really paid attention to how elaborate and clever the networks of NPCs are, and how well they accomplish a variety of game design goals. Just to give you an idea of how much work went into these NPCs, I want you to look at how many people were employed to make them. In the making of Skyrim, Bethesda employed at least 8 writers, 19 dialogue editors, and 17 audio professionals. Also, plenty of writers on game projects are credited with the title other than writer or editor, so those numbers are probably higher. That's at least 44 people whose job it was to give voice to the many speaking characters of Skyrim. And that number doesn't count the game's main design team, nor any of the dozens of voice actors who also contributed. Not everyone I've counted there was working on NPCs full-time, but you do begin to get an idea of the scope of the project. If the developers of the game knew that NPCs were important enough to dedicate that many man-hours to the project, that should tell us how much they matter to the organization of a huge open world. Thanks for watching.